The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio Welcome to the X-Zone A place where fact is fiction And fiction is reality Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we're still coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Email Exxon at ExxonRadioTV.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And we're coming to you tonight around the world on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, and Channel 34 on Simul TV. People ask me, Rob, why do you say that at the beginning of every segment? Well, that's because different affiliates and different uh, stations, networks take us at different times. So we never know which, uh, who's going to be listening, when, where, why, and how. So we decided years ago to make it plain and simple and just do an announcement about the show each segment that we start. My guest this hour, Exonation, is Lloyd Auerbach, and we've had the pleasure of having on the show uh, Lloyd on the show many, many years. Anybody who has a real interest in the paranormal, parapsychology, knows Lloyd. And uh, welcome back, Lloyd. Always great having you with us. Thank you, Rob. Nice to be here. Uh, congratulations. I understand that uh, you are part of the board of the Ryan Institute now? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just got elected, uh, pushed up from vice president to president of the board of directors of the Ryan Research Center. Well, congratulations. Uh, Thanks. And um, your second novel came out. It's a mystery, right? Yeah, um, I am the co-author of now two mystery novel, paranormal mystery novels, sort of loosely based on me and my cases. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second one, which came out in January, is called After Life. First one was called Near Death, came out a couple of years ago. They are both uh, rainy day uh, investigations. We have uh, two characters named Rainy and Day. One of them, uh, Jennifer Day, actually is based on, to some extent, on me and uh, the kinds of things that I do. You and I were talking shortly before, uh, briefly before we went on air, and uh, you were telling me that uh, that you're doing a class on a skeptic by the name of Kenny Biddle. Well, actually, I'm co-teaching a class with co-teaching. Okay, yeah, named Kenny Biddle. Yeah, um, you know, the Ryan Education Center, which is part of the Ryan Research Center, we offer online classes throughout the year, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the second time we're teaching. Kenny and I are teaching this class. Uh, part of our certificate program includes looking at parapsychology from more, a more skeptical perspective, or at least teaching how to look at things from a skeptical perspective, meaning um, open-minded, looking at the evidence, whether you decide or not, as opposed to what most skeptics call themselves, unlike Kenny. Kenny doesn't do this. Most skeptics who call themselves skeptics aren't skeptics. They are cynics. They are pseudo-skeptics, as one of my colleagues used to call them. Um, they're disbelievers. And you know, they won't even look at the evidence. What kind of evidence is there? Well, I mean, we we have huge amount of laboratory evidence for ESP and mm -hmm. psychokinesis. And now we're getting some really interesting evidence around mediumship as well. Really? Uh, this is all under control conditions. You know, not every experiment mm -hmm. is in our field. We publish things when there are just chance results. So unlike most fields, we're not avoiding that as well. Um, but we have research in what's called the Gonsfeld method, which is a light sensory deprivation, which has extraordinarily repeatable um, effects. We have remote viewing, of course, that's mm -hmm. been done both by the government and also in laboratory conditions otherwise. Uh, we have a number of precognition protocols that have been done that have been repeated over and over again by many people. 
And then on the psychokinesis front, most of our research is in the lab is mainly looking at effects on that people can do on computers and other devices, because it's really hard to get a performer to make something move on a regular basis and not have them be a fake. <laughs> so that's a problem. What, what about when it comes to uh, ghosts? Is there any is there any findings or any evidence that is that is yeah. pointing at who, what, when, where, why a ghost is? Well, that's the other side of our evidence is that you know in many fields, well, psychology, for example, mm -hmm. most experimental psychology comes a lot of it comes from observation of human beings in the wild, more or less. So our personalities and trying to figure out what makes us tick, and we're doing the same thing in the lab. But to get started with any research, you always start out with. A, a pattern you may have noticed in people's experiences outside the lab. Some of those experiences, like with ESP and Mind Over Matter, you can bring into the lab. Some, mm -hmm. like with ghosts, you can't because those are apparently generated by contact or at least some experience that seems to support or at least suggest that there's a consciousness there without a body. So we can't really bring that into the laboratory, unfortunately. But we've noticed significant patterns, not just here in, in uh, with, the, with uh, North American research, looking going back over a hundred years, but also in the UK and Europe in other parts of the world, the experiences are similar. Sometimes the conclusions or um, what the effects, how people experience these things, how they react to them is very different. What they think they are, mm -hmm. some people place the folklore, but when we get down to the nitty gritty, we have thousands of experiences of people who have seen apparitions, sometimes with other people, sometimes gaining information that they could not have known. Um, and that's a pattern that we're looking at right now. In your opinion, what is the most prevalent case that proves that there is actually life after death and communication after death? Well, first of all, uh, there's no proof in science. You know, we, uh, we gather evidence and we come mm -hmm. to a conclusion. Right. Um, there's no single case I can say. I mean, there are many, many cases on record. I mean, I know I, I have a case personally that convinced me, <clears throat> but that's not just, it wasn't done under control conditions. It's still just a case. Right. In many respects. Um, so when we're talking about, there's one major, major problem that we have in parapsychology when it comes to ghosts. If we define ghosts as a consciousness or a mind without a body, mm -hmm. we first have to understand what consciousness is in the body. And that is not yet there in science. There's too many different alternative explanations for it. Even within neuroscience, you have different ideas about what consciousness is. So there's no, not even proof of consciousness in, in, with us. We, it's an assumption. Why do you think there's such a great interest in the paranormal and that interest is constantly on the rise? Well, it's always been there. Um, we can go back you know, tens of thousands of years and people believe or want at least want to believe in an afterlife. Mm -hmm. uh, it, sometimes it's tied to religion. It's not always tied to religion. That's kind of a, a bit of folklore. Um, but we all want to know that when we die, there's something more, there's something, we have a legacy or there's something more to us. That's, that's one piece of it. The other is that the experiences around what we consider suggestive or supportive of an afterlife or of life after death are consistent and go back again, thousands of years. So that people have these experiences is different than that people talk about them. So more recently, I think because of the rise of the paranormal TV shows, you know, for ratings, let's face mm -hmm. it, uh, people have come out of the woodwork and felt comfortable talking to some people more about their experiences. But even to date, I talk to people who have never told anybody their ghost experience or psychic experience because they're afraid people are going to think they're, they're wacky. When it comes to those people who are having the experiences, Lloyd, is there a common thread between all of them or is their background, uh, their belief structure right across the board? It's totally different in some cases. You know, the, the experiences that have been reported and investigated, but um, going back again, we're going well over 100 years. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be any through thread for the people who are having these experiences. Okay. Uh, I will also say though, that no one's done a psychological study on every one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't end up doing that kind of study, but just looking at the people, it's kids, it's adults. It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter the cultural background. Uh, we don't always find that they're experiencing the same 
sensory form of this. So not everybody sees a ghost. You actually have right. cases where somebody sees the ghost, but somebody else is hearing a voice and somebody else is feeling a presence or wow. smelling something. So it's not, you know, the ghost hunters like to think about getting pictures of ghosts. It's not an optical phenomenon. If it was, and you have a ghost in the room, everybody could see it. Is it possible that the ghost that some people see is actually a figment of their imagination? Sure. And we look at that. I mean, yeah. one of the things that we deal with when we're doing any sort of investigation or research is to look for alternative explanations. Uh, you know, people do make mistakes in their perceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a really interesting thing that came up a few months ago. I found out that there were a couple of surveys by real estate companies here in the United States of um, homes in, and people owning homes or renting homes and apartments during the pandemic, during the lockdown especially. And the number of people who felt that there was some paranormal activity in their homes skyrocketed. Wow. Like to, to 70 something percent, which was insane when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned, you know, from our perspective, we don't think that all of a sudden all these homes got haunted. Right. Uh, in our, our looking at this, it is most likely that in the vast majority of those cases, the people were in their homes for the first time for 24 hours a day for many days mm. in a row. And there's noises and creaks and other things that they hadn't actually noticed before. So uh, many of those folks just simply went to the paranormal thing. You know, that's that's where people sometimes go and there's something unexplained happening. When it comes to investigating the paranormal, how do you and other researchers decide which case should be investigated and which case should not be? Well, uh, first of all, logistics is a big, a big deal for us. Yeah, I, I would imagine you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I got emails from I'll tell you a frustration I have. Um, and many of my colleagues do as well. We get emails from people telling us about what may be a potentially a good case starting out. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to get more information. The one thing that's missing, they don't ever tell us where they are. Oh, my gosh. So sometimes I have to go back. I've gone back and forth six times with someone to find out where are you. And I let's constantly keep asking that. That's one thing. We also want to, to talk to people because we mm -hmm. need to know, among other things, more detail about than just a simple experience but also when was the last time you had that experience because i over the years we get calls i get calls from people who said um i think i have a ghost in my house I said, well tell me the last you know what happened they do sounds reasonable from our perspective when was the last time you saw the ghost they said i only saw the ghost one time it was five years ago oh gosh um he he left that's all i say is he left yeah oh, we man. have to have relatively frequent at least current activity for us to investigate anything otherwise most i can do is is guess you and i have to take our break uh lloyd so please stand by exonation lloyd our back is our guest you can find out more about lloyd on his facebook page forward slash lloyd dot back dot author and for um the ryan institute ryan r-h-i-n-e dot o-r-g and we're going to be speaking to lloyd when we come back uh, about the forever family foundation right lloyd yep at the Forever, Fa Forever Family Foundation.org. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. If you'd like to send me an email, Exxon at ExxonRadioTV.com. We'll be back in a few minutes. Don't go away. Filmed 16 minutes on March 5th, 1994, 16 minutes of broad daylight UFO activity. The other side, the spirit realm, is a parallel dimension which runs, uh, uh, which coexists with ours. And what spirits are doing is they're sending waves of frequency from that dimension to ours. Uh, the government instituted the truth embargo. The government poured disinformation and misinformation into this field, encouraging hoaxes and 
any other foolishness. It created a truth vacuum that naturally was going to be filled with theories and, and assertions and other stuff. Uh, the oil oligarchs mm -hmm. and the banks and the, and the people who are making decisions that are leading us down the wrong path. They've undermined the research, intimidated and threatened witnesses. Uh, the government is responsible for the fact that the, uh, the status of this issue is not resolved. I'm Rob McConnell, host and executive producer of the X-Zone radio show. Now we are set to bring the amazing world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology to broadcast TV and online video with the development of X-Zone TV. X-Zone TV will now bring our loyal listeners and new viewers face to face with the most controversial and well-known personalities in the field of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. From scientist to theorist, astronauts to adventurers, celebrities, pundits, advocates, and naysayers, they'll all join our rapid fire TV broadcast, interactive discussion, and debate. Interest in the paranormal and parapsychology has never been more intense, and it continues to grow. The truth is out there, so take a deep breath and join us as we step into the light. For more information about Exxon TV, please contact me, Rob McConnell, directly at these coordinates, Rob McConnell at ExxonTV.com. Welcome back. Lloyd Arbor back is our guest of this hour. Lloyd, I was watching and listening to that last uh, clip, and they were talking about government conspiracies when it comes to UFOs. I've heard government conspiracies about UFOs. I've heard them about uh, Bigfoot. I've never heard a government conspiracy about ghosts and hauntings. Yeah, we don't think there is. Uh, that <laughs> This seems to be an untouchable subject by people in the government, unless they have a personal experience. Uh, you know, there could be three or four people here and there, yeah. ghosts, but um, it's not something that there's really even been any scientific funding for investigations of. Why do you think the uh, the uh, there's not more science being put behind the investigation into the paranormal? Well, just in general, the funding, uh, several of the funding sources dried up since the late 70s for parapsychology in general. There was some funding for uh, spontaneous case investigate for investigating things outside the lab for a time. But right now, there's only one major funding source for us, which is the Bial for Foundation. And they don't fund, they fund controlled laboratory research. That's pretty much it. Um, we've been hoping that like the early days of our field, that there would be someone who would be wanting to, to sponsor or fund certain things. And we ended up with Robert Bigelow, who had his essay contest on the best evidence for life after death. Uh, the top prize being $500,000 that Jeffrey Mishlove got. So he gave away a million, and, oh, I think $1.8 million to a number of folks altogether uh, for their research to go mm -hmm. forward. So down the road, there will be some, there certainly has been output from their essays, but there'll be more output. And there's now another, I can't call it a contest, but a, another situation where he's going to give out more money for the best types of research in a certain specific area. But for the most part, um, Mainstream science in the United States and Canada also, uh, less so in the UK, but mainstream science, academia, partly because of the activities of the so-called skeptics organizations since the late 1970s, have, have just, no, nobody in mainstream science wants to touch this from a public perspective. Uh, I and many of my colleagues have talked to researchers in all sorts of fields who pull us aside after telling us that there's no such thing here as any of this, and then they tell us their ghost story. They just didn't want to embarrass themselves in front of their colleagues. At least that's what we hear. But wouldn't they? The, what, yeah, this makes no sense to me looking at it from my angle. It, it seems like they want to get aboard and research something that so many people are talking about. Absolutely. I, You know, the thing that really drives me nuts mm -hmm. is that so many people are having these experiences and have had them over the years, and that this is a subject that nobody wants to touch in, main, in the mainstream. 
I would think that they would want to do the research uh, to actually go out and find out, okay, they don't believe in ghosts. That's fine. Tell me why these people are having these experiences. What is the other yeah. explanation for this? Because, you know, I hear, I hear, honestly, I hear crazy explanations when people, uh, from people who disbelieve in this stuff, you know, uh, including things like mass hallucination. You have five people who have the experience. They all have the same experience. It's mass hallucination. It's like, show me the scientific research on mass, mass hallucination. In fact, show me the scientific research on coincidence. Yeah. You can't create a coincidence in the lab. A lot of investigators that we get on the show talk about EVPs, and that has to be one of the most perplexing things that yeah. that I can think of. Because here you've got, they ask a question, they don't hear an answer, but when they play the recording device, whether it's digital or analog later on, there's a voice there. What's so your take on EVPs? Well, you know, EVP research goes back, I think, the 1930s. Uh, initially, actually, uh, Thomas Edison wanted to do something like that mm. years before that. Um, <clears throat> the problem with EVP is the very definition of it. Uh, most of the ghost hunters out there seem to think that there's some audio component, some sound component, that they're just not hearing either a different, you know, I hear people saying, oh, it's, it's a different frequency. You need to look at the actual ability of your recorder to record something that's a dif different frequency than the sound we can hear, because they can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, there has been EVP under control conditions. It's pretty rare to have one that's clearly identifiable and the language is identifiable. Um, for the most part, if it's real, when it's real and not mumblings or, uh, or the sound of somebody's stomach gurgling or, or sometimes a fart, <laughs> excuse me. Um, <laughs> uh, when it's real, it's electronic voice phenomena, meaning the voice was created in the device. You can get EVP technically if it's real. You can get it with the microphone disabled because the whole idea is that you're recording something or the device actually picks up something or the device allows for something that cannot be heard. So if this is going on, it is a form of mind over matter, psychokinesis. The ghost would have to make that voice appear on that tape or on that uh, digital recording on right. the device. just like the same with with photos by the way um if you get a photo of something and it truly is anomalous and may be connected to an experience it would have to be somebody impressing that on the device or on the film problem with that is living people can affect devices so we don't know if there's really a ghost doing it or if it's the unconscious mind of the operator speaking about photographs orbs are uh orbs are, are that's my four letter word. Um, we know who connected orbs or the idea of these bubbles yeah. on film to the idea of spirits and then later on recanted that. What's the it. history behind it? So this came up mainly, I mean, there had been those kind of bubble type pictures. I, I know that some UFO enthusiasts were not happy about ghost hunters picking up on this. Um, there was also a group in New Mexico, I think it was, of, of researchers who claimed that the orbs were actually energy beings from another dimension. Uh, but it was the International Ghost Hunter Society. It was um, Dave Oster and Sharon Gill. Yeah. No longer with us. They are the ones who promoted the idea of orbs as spirits. And that's an illogical conclusion, uh, especially when then 99% of them at least are explainable if you understand the conditions under which the picture was taken, the type of camera that was, was used, and the conditions in the, in, in the area for that. Um, it's not hard to explain those away. And they're they're taken all over the place. So does that mean that there are ghosts everywhere? And how come nobody ever sees them when you take a picture? Mm. So there's so many things that tell us, um, including the, the leap in logic that was done originally to promote them. There's so much that says this has nothing to do with the paranormal. And when people send me pictures of orbs, especially, but also other things, the first question I ask them, why do you think this is paranormal? I mean, you took an orb picture in your house. Okay, that's fine. Why do you think it was paranormal? It was taken with a flash. I can only see this much, just like I'm seeing you, Rob, right now. Right. Seeing, I have no idea what's the rest of your behind you or on the sides and so on. You have no idea right now what's what's outside my frame. Right. So there could be like, you know, windows, mirrors, semi-reflective surfaces. You don't really know what could be reflecting that flash. That's one part of it. That's only one simple explanation. 
I do know that when when um, the the group started promoting it, especially, and it became very popular to take these ore pictures in the late '90s, Fujifilm actually had a web page that explained orbs because they were getting hit with so many questions about them. Unbelievable. Another topic that the ghost investigators and I, I question how somebody can call themselves an investigator when they've actually done no training to be an investigator. You, well, my friend, have paid your dues over the many years. You've got the yeah. credentials to, to, you know, to qualify you as such. But you get these people who are watching a ghost show on TV and they decide, oh, I'm going to become a ghost investigator. All right, here we go. I get my, my recorder and I get whatever else they can buy online and away they go. Uh, I've seen shows where people go out and are act, you know, actively taunting yeah. what they believe are spirits. I'm saying, why would you do that? Because they're doing it because they saw somebody on TV do that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I used to liken this, not that the show's on anymore, but you know, one of the longest running reality shows was cops. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so we don't, we didn't have people going out there and trying to be cops, fake cops. Right. Yeah. Um, People mimic what they see on TV quite often, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And ghost hunting was an easy thing for them to mimic, but they have a have a total lack. Many of them have no lack or have a lack of understanding of how television is made, especially and how reality TV is made. Uh, just because it's unscripted doesn't mean it's not directed. Doesn't exactly. mean that the people on TV are not given what to say. Um, all of that and the whole mm -hmm. taunting thing again, it comes from a couple of different shows. It makes no sense whatsoever literally makes no sense, especially I have had calls from people over the years who had a local ghost hunting group come in. They felt that there was something, the couple felt that there was something paranormal happening in their house. Honestly, it really wasn't, but um, from what they've told me, but the group comes in, they, they sometimes kick the family out, go to a motel and they want to stay in the house alone. Sometimes they let them stay. They do their EVP. They sometimes taunt the ghost, start yelling which pisses off the family, by the way, makes them really mad. Uh, and then. Whoops. Where did Lloyd go? I don't oh, know. There he is. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, because they, because they got a growl, supposedly got a growl on their EVP. They mm -hmm. immediately declared a demon. And uh, sometimes they'll call. I mean, I have one couple that told me they went to a motel at four o'clock in the morning, they get a call from this this group saying, we had to leave your house. We got a growl on the EVP. You have a demon in your house. And they left. <laughs> Unreal. It was crazy. Do these, do these groups pose a danger to the people's psychology who are calling them in for help? And they make these, you know, these assumptions that are not based on anything factual. And for example, this, this, <coughs> group that called the people at the hotel and said yeah, hey listen that, yeah that that they they basically traumatized that family um sometimes i think not all groups are like this you mm -hmm. know there are thousands of ghost hunter groups in the united states alone uh, yeah, many yeah. more in canada and many groups you have people who are trying their best to understand what's going on <clears throat> uh but you know i think that so many of them are really paranormal thrill seekers or tourists paranormal tourists uh, or just fans of the TV show trying to mimic what they're doing. And those people can sometimes traumatize the clients. Um, I've seen situations where a ghost hunter group posts a photo and the address of the home that they Ooh. investigated on their website, which, you know, they're lucky that they don't get sued. Um, at some, you know, I've, I've actually talked one group down through, a, through someone involved in the group from doing that because I, told them, look, you know, if they try to sell their house and they somebody finds that online and decides the house isn't worth it, you have a lawsuit. Yeah. And things like that are things that, that these ghost hunters need to consider. Um, in our field, I mean, very honestly, when I do an investigation and everyone in our field, we have an ethical thing that we deal, deal with, which is we want to study the phenomena. We want to understand the phenomena. But if somebody asks for help, we give them help before any of the other, before any, certainly any long-term studies or anything like that. We have to figure out what's going on. We have to help them. We have to find out what they need and, and try to provide that first. How often is it a case where the person actually has some mental issues and how do you deal with that? 
for the most part, most of the folks in my field um, who do investigations and my students who have gone through this, we, we the, the initial interview, which is always almost always done by phone or by Zoom, mm -hmm. you kind of get an idea of that. And, and honestly, if you're dealing with a family, you really have, you sometimes have family members humoring one person, but if you can get them aside or talk to them separately, you find out that they're not really having an experience in that way. Um, we, it's a small percentage and it's, it's really rare that we go into a situation where someone has a psychological issue. Uh, sometimes we're not completely aware. I, in my early days, I ended up with two cases where um, it was the women, the wives that were calling me in, calling us in, uh, thinking that they were, stuff was flying around, kind of poltergeisty type cases. And both of them, both of them turned out to be uh, situations which were domestic. Um, they were not paranormal at all. And both times it was guys who were drunk with, you know, husbands who were drunk. One case, domestic violence too. Lloyd, stand by. We've got to take a break at the bottom of the hour. Exxon Nation, Lloyd Arbach's our guest. Uh, you can find him on Facebook, I believe it's Lloyd.Auerbach.Author, and then the Ryan Institute at Ryan.org. And we're going to be talking about the Forever Family Foundation when we come back at ForeverFamilyFoundation.org. This is the Excellent I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Lloyd, our back is our guest this hour. And Lloyd, we've been talking, or I've been mentioning the Forever Family Foundation. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, the Forever Family Foundation, which I'm president of, is an organization that has been, since the mid-2000s, has been working with uh, certifying, testing, certifying, evidential mediums, and working them into the family grieving process. I mean, it was started by people who found enormous relief by working with a few evidential uh, mediums. They started this to help other folks. They also initially, I mean, they, to, the testing process was created by a group of, of researchers they consulted. Mm -hmm. So it's done with not strict laboratory controls, but fairly strict controls. And actually, I think it's about 90% of the people who try the tests, the mediums who come in to try it, don't pass. So um, we've had some of our best mediums have to take it two or three times. Uh, there's an interview process for that, and we also run grief retreats, or at this point we're running four grief retreats per year in different parts of the U.S., which incorporate a grief counselor who does presentations, presentation of evidence for life after death, so the scientific evidence, and then we also have mediums doing their work as well. So it's kind of a combination. The foundation's always been highly supportive of scientific research. Um, on any aspect of evidence for life after death, uh, whether it's ghosts or mediumship or reincarnation, any of the research that's being gone, done in parapsychology at this point. When it comes to proof of life af after death, uh, what kind of proof is there? <clears throat> Again, we have evidence, you know, ultimately, let's put it this way. Ultimately, 
we won't know mm -hmm. individually at this this point in our existence. We won't know until we die. Yeah. And of course, as one of my colleagues, Gertrude Schmeidler, said, you'll only know if you're wrong, if you don't believe in it. <laughs> so um, because otherwise you don't know anything. Right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but looking at people's experiences and then doing some research in the laboratory where we can, uh, whether it is children who remember previous lives, whether it is mediumship, evident, truly evidential mediumship done under extreme control conditions, such as what the Winbridge Research Center does. Uh, with mediums, whether it is looking at the patterns with apparitions and out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, all of that provides us with a base of evidence that suggests that consciousness can exist without the body and potentially continue on who knows for how long. The ultimate problem, we don't know what consciousness is. So basically we're living in a, a meat suit until the time the meat suit cacks out and then we carry on somewhere else. That's that's the idea. But then, yeah. you know, they have the true materialist perspective is that we're meat robots that only think we think. And when we die, you know, die our programming ceases. So yeah. what about all these different haunted locations that have become part of the para tourism industry? For example, Waverly, everybody goes to Waverly. Everybody hears and sees stuff at Waverly. And yeah. my question is, if these places are truly inundated with ghosts or spirits. They're why not. do they tolerate these inconveniences? Right. So first of all, we make a distinction between what's called a haunting and a ghost or apparition. Okay. Um, you know what they, on TV, they like to talk about intelligent ghosts. Yes. Intelligent spirits. Right. Well, first of all, I don't know that all humans are intelligent when they're alive. So I'll drink to that. It's a term we don't usually use. We use conscious, okay. not intelligent. Right. So the majority of things that people experience are what we would consider what they call residual hauntings, or we would consider imprints or information in the environment that we let the living pick up. Uh, and emotional stuff is the most obvious stuff we pick up. I mean, a great example that practically everybody has experienced in some way, shape or form is walking into a place, let's say a house or an apartment where you're house hunting, looking mm -hmm. for a place to live. And you're looking at a bunch of places and some of them feel really good and some of them feel like crap. Yeah, yeah. And it has nothing to do with the decor or the smell at all. So there's something about the owners, the people who live there, that kind of impregnates the environment, information. Um, whether it's ESP, you're picking up the, that information or something biological, we're still not sure. I mean, that's there's a couple of models that we look at for that. But this is the common thing. Waverly, for example, is a great example. Any hospital terminal ward feels icky, even if you didn't know it's a terminal ward. And there's something to be said about humans leaving information behind. Um, so that's the majority of what's out there. And honestly, I think, I, first of all, I don't know that the spirits would stick around at a place like Waverly, especially if after it's been abandoned, unless they're all having parties every night or something like that. You know, I hear people want to go to cemeteries for ghosts. Like, if you were dead, would you hang around a cemetery? I mean, come Hell on. no. That makes no sense. Yeah. That's, that's why we find so many bars and restaurants are haunted. Huh. Yeah, that's where you'll find me when I go. Yeah. Um, what about the something that isn't talked about a lot is haunted funeral homes? That's a good question. Yeah, that's really good. The fact is that very few of them are haunted. Yeah. And you would, um, and you would think that if any place is going to be haunted, would be where the person is laying in state and all the all the all the sadness. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I think that the grief piece of it, depending on where what part of the funeral home you're in, mm -hmm. is, is something you might feel, and certainly you feel that at a cemetery sometimes as well. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, but but you know, this goes back to this whole cemetery thing. When go when ghost hunters or other people say, "I want to go to a cemetery and find some ghosts," like, you know, at some point they were in a funeral home or in a morgue. Mm -hmm. So what was the spirit just hanging around their body waiting for the, the thing to be moved to a cemetery and now they've moved to the cemetery? It, it just doesn't make any sense from a human ha perspective. Have you heard of any morgues that are haunted? Not particularly. Yeah. No, no. no. See, I, I, again, you know, I, I can't imagine someone sticking around their dead body if they have the ability to move around, which we do see. Now, what, one of the things we find, which is really interesting, is that sometimes what's reported to us, whether it's over time um, by many people who live there or work mm -hmm. there, or whether it's psychics and mediums, as well as the witnesses, 
because we want witnesses who are not psychics and mediums as well, that the ghosts or the spirits that are supposedly there are often thinking that they can't go anywhere. I mean, they stay in the location. But we know that that's not the case from other people's experiences. Um, for example, the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum, mm -hmm. which is here in the Bay Area, which has dozens of seemingly interactive conscious entities, all seemingly ex-Navy, um, a couple that have been identified, because it's hard to identify from a crew complement of thousands over the years, a couple that have been identified did not die on the ship. They died in civilian life, and they came back to the ship. Hmm. And the reasoning for that um, usually when I get asked if I'm on the ship, I used to get asked and I'd say, go talk to that 85 year old docent who is taking people around the ship. And the answer is, this was a connection that they had when they were alive to this historic ship. Um, one of the docents told me that was the best time of my life. It's like during World War II is the best time of your life. That's crazy. But that's how they feel about the ship. So people go seemingly go to places not necessarily where they died, but where they lived. A lot of new homes are being built. Yeah. We hear about the hauntings of older homes, the the homes that look as if they'd come from an Alfred Hitchcock movie that <laughs> is haunted. H have you or any of your uh, fellow investigators heard of any brand new homes that are being built that are haunted? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, first of all, sometimes you have to chalk it up to the land that the house is on. Okay. That's, that's one thing that can happen. Not necessarily haunted by entities, by ghosts. Um, but there are homes that seem to, again, if we're talking about information imprinted in the environment, mm -hmm. then technically any home can be haunted even by your own yourself, uh, by your own imprints that you leave behind. One of my earliest cases, the, the house was, the whole neighborhood was really less than six, six years old. And this couple had been living there for almost six months. They had bought it from a previous couple, first owners, young people, you know, in their 20s, moved into Manhattan. This is in Westchester County, New York. And the new couple was being woken up every night uh, between 2 and 4 a.m. Uh, by the sounds of people making love in the, in the next room very loudly. And that sound was waking them up literally every night, ex except for Sunday nights to Monday mornings. So, <laughs> yeah, and they were, it was very, very amusing for me and embarrassing for them phone call, I have to tell you. Um, but when, when I looked into the whole, I know it's a very funny thing. I, it got written up by a friend of mine in, in Playgirl magazine. I've actually been in Playgirl with, as, uh, as the sexorcist, by the way. You animal. Yeah. <laughs> so... What I, I I was working for the American Society for Psychical Research at the time, went up, uh, it was not too far from where, where I was living at the time, um, talked to them about it, uh, got the, you know, this was a very distinct pattern that was happening. And I, I got the names and the phone number of the previous owners. Mm -hmm. And I called the previous owner. Uh, this was after a weekend after I'd been up there on a Friday night. And I said to start to talk to the guy, I said, I identified who I was. He was a stockbroker. I identified who I was. I said, the couple living in the house that you sold them um, thinks their house is haunted. And before I could say anything else, he was getting very defensive. Like, well, they, if they've been there for six months, they can't want out of the deal. This, this is ridiculous. The house is going <laughs> on. And then I said to him, what does three o'clock in the morning mean to you and your wife? Oh, boy. And there was silence. And then he told me, he said, why? And I told him what was going on. He said, yeah, we... We, we were young. We got married like right out of college. We bought the house before uh -huh. we lived there for five. And yeah, we had a ritual every night around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. I guess we were allowed. I guess we left something <laughs> behind. So things like that, you yeah. know, um, it was they were annoying. That's what the, 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 yeah. ghost, the spirits were annoying. To the, to the uh, speaking of, of physical contact, has is physical contact with a, a ghost or a spirit possible? Well, you know, it seems, it seems that very few ghosts uh, have the ability to actually physically interact with the environment, the movement. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about this, as I mentioned earlier, ghosts are not optical. So if somebody right, were right. to see a ghost, to see that figure, first of all, they see them looking younger or in health, better health than they were when they died. That's number one. <clears throat> they're wearing clothing. 
All right. So how that we think this is working is that the ghost is pure mental energy, only has psychic senses, ESP. Humans pick up certain things, different information, certain way through our own ESP. And the ghost is thinking of it, the ghost is broadcasting what they look like, what they sound like, what they smell like. It's a self-image. We all have a self-image of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We usually look better than we did, you know, than we do right now. I mean, if I were a ghost right now, I'd be a little bit younger. My beard would be darker. I'd have more hair. So um, along with that, if the ghost is putting out the idea, the idea to your mind that they are touching you, you may pick that up and feel it, even though it's not a physical touch. Hmm. Much like if I were to hypnotize someone, I'm not a hypnotherapist myself, but someone in deep hypnosis, you can tell them that they're being touched and wave your hand behind their back and they will feel like they were being touched. Unbelievable. How much does the pareidolia effect play in the world of the paranormal? It, it certainly plays into... Um, when people see things that are, you know, human beings are, are looking for patterns. That's what we sure. do. That's why we can see things in clouds and such. And especially with the orb stuff or with any so-called ghostly fig, fig, uh, photograph. Mm -hmm. you know, I, people, again, send me pictures and they say, can you see that face in the window? And when I look at it, it's some shadowy thing. And yeah, you could make out a face if you really try. But that's us trying to make sense of a, a pattern. The same thing happens listening to EVP. That's an audio pareidolia. And people, there have been studies recently showing that um, when, when a certain EVP was played, they did a bunch of different ones, but they played them for a group of people and 85% of them did not agree on what it was, hmm. what the person who recorded it said it was. 15% kind of got it. Um, after they were told what it said, it flipped. 85% of them did hear that. 15% still didn't hear it. The 15% of them were literalists. Lloyd, as always, whenever you're with us, uh, time goes by so fast. Again, I thank you for everything you've done over the years. Thank you for trying to help people make sense of what is real and what is possible. And uh, congratulations on your nomination to the Board of Directors for the Ryan Institute. Any final thoughts for the exonation tonight? Just that people should be cautious about the, what they think is truth when it comes right down to it, when it comes to the paranormal, uh, because there's so much disinformation and misinformation out there mm -hmm. on the web with people trying to make themselves look good. Uh, most Many ghost hunting groups want to make a TV show. That's what they really are. They want to be celebrities. They don't really want to figure out what's going on. And if they're not asking why this is happening, how this is happening, they're not really investigators. They are just paranormal thrill seekers. Finally, can you give our listeners uh, the way to contact you as well as the Family Fa Forever Foundation and the Rhine? Sure. So the Forever Family Foundation, which is free to join, by the way, is foreverfamilyfoundation.org. The Rhine Research Center, Rhine, R-H-I-N-E dot org. And you can go find out about our classes by clicking on the education link that's there. People can get a hold of me through Facebook. It's facebook.com slash lloyd.auerbach.author. Or you can email me. I'll give you my email. It's prof paranormal, as in professor paranormal, P-R-O-F paranormal at gmail.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at prof paranormal. Always a pleasure. Take care of yourself, my friend, and uh, keep the great work up. Thank you, Rob. Good night, Lloyd. Yeah. Exo Nation, Lloyd Auerbach has been my guest this hour. When we come back, more about the strange, the weird, the bizarre, something that we call the paranormal here in the Exo from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. You have heard of the Exo? Now watch it on Simo TV plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like Exxon, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. 
live streaming events from around the world, interactive online network, and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today.